Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Jakari Jackson. It's August 24th, 2015, and here's a look at our top stories. You look at what's going on in Egypt, you look what's going on in Iraq, you look what's going on in Somalia, Sudan, every, it's, it's chaos. The global economy has collapsed. The Fed has printed so much for so long. And this is why I'm predicting that the, and you've heard me talk about it for years, the vulnerability of the dollar. President Obama has indicated this is going to be one of the most open and transparent yeah. governments um, we've ever seen. And as one of his representatives, I would ask that you actually respond to the question, which is, did you ever notice that um, you were corresponding with Secretary Clinton on, a, uh, on, on an account that was not a, not, uh, that was not a .gov account? Congressman, I, I always you ever notice that yes or no. I, I always uh, made sure I was corresponding with the right person. Let's uh, not make, listen, uh, listen, you're very good at this, not answering questions. I don't have a lot of investments, but I have a couple. And every time I would speak to my, I guess you call it investment advisor, and I tell them that I don't want to invest in the stock market, they get this arrogant laugh like, <laughs> like you don't want to invest in the stock market. What's wrong with you? Don't you know you're going to make X number of dollars over the course of the several years? Well. I knew things like this. We have the headline, while media peddled delusion, InfoWars predicted great crash of 2015. Even as late as last week, news outlets like CNBC were urging viewers to invest in the stock market, ludicrously suggesting that the market was simply having a dull year and that this would be good for investors. Well, we've had numerous people on the show like Gerald Salente and Harry Dent and Dr. Ron Paul and Peter Schiff who all told us that in this day was going to come. Some people said it could come as late as October this year, but they all said pretty much in this late summer, early fall time frame. And now we have the article, Black Friday stock markets collapse amid global sell-off. The Dow Jones Industrial Average fell 1,000 points on Monday amid a huge decline in Chinese stocks and a global sell-off. And we have all those people and so many more who are going to break this down for you and prove that we and our guests predicted this a long time coming. They're flooding into Greece. They're flooding into Italy. Afghanistan, you mentioned Greece. Flooding into Greece. You look at what's going on in Egypt. You look what's going on in Iraq. You look what's going on in Somalia, Sudan. Every, it's, it's chaos. The global economy has collapsed. Commodity prices are down to 2,002 levels. We were in a recession in 2002. And Just Gerald, I looked it up. Since they created the National Grain Reserves in World War II, it's never been empty. The government has exhausted the grain. I, I mean, they've never done that. And you look, look, at coal, look at, as I said, commodity prices, corn. From corn to coal to copper to iron ore. Everything has collapsed. China's not buying this stuff. Look at the data. Look what just came out today. Stay there. Stay there. I'll, Gerald Salente, Trends Forecaster, joins us. How close are we to the big event? Well, you know, they give us the numbers. They fudge them, but the uh, Wall Streeters still believe it. But I think they're getting more reluctant. That market is pretty shaky. But uh, the other day when they gave us the GDP number, they said it was, what, 0.2 increase. But if you looked at the inventory increase, they use that as a positive. Oh, they're building up. People are going to buy. But sometimes the inventory builds up because nobody's buying. And if you remove that, which I think is artificial, you have, and I think you mentioned, a negative growth. It was probably down a couple percent. And there's a limit to how much bad news can be twisted into being good news. And I think they're running out of steam. I think the, the Fed has printed so much for so long. And this is why I'm predicting that the, and you've heard me talk about it for years, the vulnerability of the dollar. And we've had a free ride for a long time. We were, they had the reserve currency of the world, and people have been more or less forced to it. But there are countries now thinking about alternatives, and there's other countries that are buying the gold. Uh, so I think uh, even even technically look, speaking right now, the dollar is looking uh, like it may have already started down. You know, it's, uh, it was up like 35 percent in the last year or two, and, and now it's turning around and starting down. I think we're still seeing the beginning 
of the falling dollar. The big question is, is people only look at the other currencies, say, oh, the dollar's fallen. Does that mean we have to buy euros or something else? No, it's all a mess. And when the dollar crash comes, people won't trust any of the currencies. They'll go to real money. They will buy gold and silver. They're going to latch on to anything that's real. And even real estate and other things like this will serve as a uh, preservation of wealth, and it won't be in holding dollars. Unfortunately, I don't see how you could economically be incorrect about what you're saying. And even mainline analysts admit that no bubble's ever gone this far. Is the day of judgment for the Federal Reserve and other private central banks coming? Yeah, I think uh, for the not to come would be a surprise to me. And you've been involved in this a long time. I mean, it wasn't like you didn't know what was happening with the housing bubble. And we had the NASDAQ bubble. And uh, now, now we have other bubbles. We still have another stock market bubble, and there's another housing bubble going on. But the big bubble, I think, is in the bond bubble. It's been going on for 35 years, taking interest rates from 21% down to actually negative. And they've been getting away with it. So this means distortion. Not only is there money involved, but it distorted all the investment over these periods of time. And the biggest distortion that it encourages debt. It encourages debt for a lot of people, but in particular, government. And as long as our government uh, is able to print the reserve currency, it's going to limp along, even though our economy is limping along. But that will come to an end. And uh, right now, we're starting to see the whole thing coming apart. I mean, we look at Detroit as an example. We see what's happening in Greece. They're worrying about what's going to happen uh, you know, after Greece is recognized as actually totally bankrupt. There'll be other countries. This distortion has been going on for so long. Most people think that when governments print money, that the only thing that happens is that prices go up as a consequence of inflation. And a lot of that is true, and it's a serious problem and destroys the middle class and the poor. But to me, the bigger distortion is the lack of pricing for money and causing people to do dumb things. And that's why they overbuild and overinvest and governments overspend. And then you have the Keynesians still in charge that says, <clears throat> that says that the solution for this is just to spend more money and print more money, and that's coming to an end. <clears throat> the day of reckoning is, uh, is, is at hand. Where do you see all this going? What's your take on the China situation? A lot of predictions by smart people that this winter is going to be hellish on markets, uh, bond markets, you name it. I mean, uh, give us your analysis of that. Well, I'm, most people are optimistic, I think, on the market, certainly the U.S. market. I don't, I don't share that. I, I don't think the market's going to collapse, though, because I don't think the Federal Reserve will allow it to collapse. I don't believe that the Federal Reserve is going to raise interest rates like everybody thinks. In fact, if you look at the testimony of Janet Yellen this week, she testified up on Capitol Hill, all the headlines were about how she's about to raise rates, how she reaffirms that the Fed's going to raise rates this year, that helped the dollar, that sent gold to a new low for the year. But if you actually look at what she said, she didn't say she was going to raise rates. All she said was that if the economy evolves the way they expect, which is a big if, because it never evolves the way they expect. They've In been fact, saying that for two years. If it gets better, they're going to raise them. Yeah, but they didn't even say they're going to raise them. All she said is if the economy evolves as they expect, it may be appropriate to raise rates. Not that it will be appropriate, but that it might be. And even if it is appropriate to raise them, that doesn't mean the Fed will raise them. I mean, the Fed could say, well, it's appropriate, but we're not going to do it because we don't want to. I mean, it's been appropriate to raise rates for years, and they haven't done it. In fact, it wasn't appropriate to lower them to zero. This is not about propriety. This is about expedience. And I think the Fed will keep interest rates at zero regardless of what's appropriate. The cheap money, quantitative easing, 0% interest rates, it was the Fed's manipulation of money supply and interest rates that inflated the bubbles. You know, sure, they had help from Congress, but I think the chief enabler is the Federal Reserve, and they've done a lot of damage. And I think when people come to terms with this reality, it's going to be a huge game changer. I think the bottom is going to drop out of the dollar in a very big way. I think you're going to see a spectacular reversal in gold prices, silver prices, commodity prices, when people realize that, you know, we are just going to print and print and print. The Fed is just getting started. Uh, the helicopters are still in the hangars. They're getting warmed up. Uh, this is going to be, <laughs> more, you know, more money printing. And this is not going to end well. This is not the happy picture, the smiley face that Janet Yellen is putting on this or all the Wall Street economists 
and there's not a lot of time. You know, people have been riding this bubble on the dollar. Uh, the U.S. stock market made new highs. Uh, people need to act now. You know, people need to open up accounts, you know, at, with me at Europe Pacific's Capital so that they can get their money out of U.S. assets, get out of Dodge before the bullets start flying. Uh, you got to get into foreign stocks and the, and the right stocks. I mean, there are certain countries, Switzerland, Singapore, New Zealand, I mean, Hong Kong, there are places that you should invest to escape the carnage. And you got to get out of U.S. currency. You got to pick the best foreign currencies. You got to own real money. You got to own gold and silver. You got to look at the opportunity in the mining shares that have been beaten down because people have no idea what's going on. The people who have been selling gold, selling gold stocks, these are the same well, guys sure. in the subprime mortgages. Well, the elites, the elites are hoarding. And we'll end our segment tonight with this before we go on to more special reports in our later segments. Jack Lew, the Treasury Secretary, was being grilled about his communications with one Hillary Clinton. Now, a lot of people are saying that the Hillary email scandal isn't the big scandal it's hyped up to be. And personally, I think the Benghazi thing is a much bigger deal, but they want to focus on this for whatever reason. And now people are being questioned about her involvement in these servers that aren't exactly the most secure. And now we see Representative Sean Duffy coming after Mr. Jack Lew. So we'll go out to break with this and come back with more special reports. I mean, President Obama has indicated this is going to be one of the most open and transparent yeah. governments um, we've ever seen. And as one of his representatives, I would ask that you actually respond to the question, which is, did you ever notice that um, you were corresponding with Secretary Clinton on, a, uh, on an account that was not a not uh, that was not a dot gov account? Congressman, I, I always that yes or no. I, I always uh, made sure I was corresponding with the right person. That's uh, not my, listen, uh, listen, you're very good at this, not answering questions, and I appreciate the way you tap dance. But I think everyone in the room understands my question, and you're just not answering it. Did you know that you were corresponding with Secretary Clinton on a on an account that was not a dot gov account? Yes or no, Congressman? I, I don't remember giving it a lot of thought at the That's time. Not my, whether you give a lot of thought or not is not my question. The question is. Did you know you were corresponding with her on an, yeah. on an email it, that was a, 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 a it's a long, It's a long time ago. I've, so you're saying you don't remember? Is that your testimony? I, I, I'm, I'm just telling is you. Is it your testimony that you don't remember? I, I'm just telling you that um, I, 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 when I emailed with people, when I emailed with people, I always make sure. So is it fair to say right? you don't want to answer my question, Mr. Secretary? Because you, 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 know the, you, know the, you know the question I'm asking, and you're refusing to answer it. So I guess what I'm assuming is you knew you were corresponding with her on an account that was a non-official account. And I, and I understand you don't want to lie to Congress, and I appreciate that, and you don't want to be part of a news story. I appreciate that, so you don't want to answer my question. But I think all of us here understand that you're saying, I knew that it was a non-official account. I just don't want to tell you. Everyone knows that at nauseum, we have predicted exactly what's now happening. Number one, that's not hard to do because the globalists act like we're five years old and write about it in their, in their internal periodicals and in their own publications, which are available, but not widely distributed. So their plan to leverage the world, create 2.2 quadrillion in derivatives, get every major government of the West to sign on to it, to hold the public hostage with too big to fail is a public plan. Derivatives have only gotten worse since the last crisis of 2008. This crisis undoubtedly is going to dwarf, massively dwarf what we saw in 2008. Now, the globalists don't even know exactly how they're going to carry this out. They know they've engineered it. They know they're going to consolidate power out of the collapse. They know they're going to call for global SDR, new global taxes, to backstop the economy and create a new bubble. But once they trigger the current phase of the crisis, they're orchestrating the larger phase, the larger continuum. But when they get into a new phase of the crisis, they gauge it first, do trial balloons to decide exactly what they're going to pull. But in general, we know what's going to happen. This may be the beginning of the true mega implosion. Or they may get some more banker bailouts, steal trillions more from the different countries, consolidate the economy, create an IMF World Bank emergency slush fund, which they then give to their own pockets uh, as, quote, a worldwide stimulus package, and then quasi-stabilize Chinese, uh, Japanese, U.S., and European markets for another six months, a year, maybe two years. But the smart money says that's not what's happening because the elites are running around, as we've told you, like chickens with their heads cut off. Remember, two months ago, I shot the video headline, Total Emergency Alert. 
I've said emergency alert before, but never total emergency alert in 20 years on air. Total emergency alert. The elite are literally going to their bunkers, their airstrips, their northern Canada redoubts, their Cook Island redoubts, their their armored fortresses, uh, one of the biggest houses in the world with four-foot-thick concrete walls and huge bars on the windows with an underground base, admittedly in the Ozarks, connected to the Defense Department. I mean, there is a lot of whacked-out stuff going on, and elites are buying gold and silver like it is going you know, to the moon. We have got armored vehicles getting delivered everywhere, Marines and Army training for civil unrest, the Pentagon admitting they're preparing for it, with George Soros trying to cause a race war triggered uh, by attacking the police. I mean, we've got a lot of different things coming together right now. We've got forced inoculations being announced all over the world, from Australia to the U.S., from California to Australia. We've got the planets aligning. We have al-Qaeda being turned loose worldwide to attack Christian and non-radical Muslim targets. It is unprecedented. But remember, we had Mr. Dent on two weeks ago. I believe it's to the day. We'll uh, put the article up with the YouTube on screen right now. Two weeks ago, I believe to the day, he came on and said, two weeks, it's a dead cat bounce. Look at the charts. And you can look at the one-year chart, the five-year chart, the, the month chart. You can see the dead cat mounts, and now it's headed straight now. A thousand points last week. Uh, when trading opens up, as I'm recording this right before we go live, David Knight is uh, going to be in studio live. I'll be calling in from a connection in Chicago. I'm recording this basically at the airport via audio Skype two hours before the show starts. So I'll be in the air when the show starts. I'll be landing about an hour in. And as soon as I can, I've got a two-hour layover. After I clear customs, I will be calling in via audio Skype or video Skype from O'Hare. So we're going to be tracking all of this as it unfolds. But they may close the stock market today. Uh, they may have a bank holiday this week. Anything is possible. They may keep it open and let it go all the way down two or 3,000 points. I mean, this route could be massive. We're going to find out what happens today. I don't know if they're going to decide to buoy it or they're going to decide to let it fall. But China uh, basically lowering their currency, the, I guess yuan, I always pronounce it wrong, is the signal that they are not going to hold up the dollar anymore. And notice China is ceasing, basically uh, cutting back to almost nothing, their purchase of U.S. Treasury notes. All of this signals what we already saw in the tea leaves building up to this. We should have collapsed a long time ago, but they artificially pumped this bubble up to where now, when the bubble goes, it is going to be ultra massive. And we see all of these paramilitary preparations. Clearly, they're looking at staging race riots during an economic collapse to act like the race riots caused the economic collapse. And they're trying to stir up the giant disenfranchised inner city populations to basically go out and start looting and thugs of every ilk to join forces and go out and engage in criminal activity to further destroy confidence. So again, the globalists will get up on TV and talk about confidence all day and talk about buying into their bubbles all day, or they'll say you're killing confidence when in truth they're the ones that have created this global bubble and suck people into their confidence to defraud them. If you read the IMF World Bank documents that got leaked, it's like an owner's manual to tyranny. In 2002, it talks about once they turn the money off, once they implode an economy, once they give the green light in a country to the media that, 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 the, that the mega banks control to say that there's a panic, they will then come out and say to everyone, oh my gosh, you know, look at this riot in the street. The police can't do anything. That will then spread. The police will be ordered to stand down like they were done uh, in several U.S. cities this year, like Maryland, uh, Baltimore, Maryland, and other areas. And then when that carnage spreads, it will further destroy confidence and drop the market artificially to below what it's even worth, maybe 50 percent, 60 percent. I'm not saying that's happening today. That's the next phase. Then the globalist will come in with a police state, clean that up, and be the saviors, jack the market back up some, and then take major profits 
on the backs of those that were panicked. So this is how they operate. And we know, because it's called in the 100-point-plus plan, the IMF riot. The IMF World Bank calls it the IMF riot because they will then trigger and green light through their agitators, through their uh, city organizers, like Obama, Stalinsky techniques, this is all IMF World Bank runs, when the big foundations fund all these leftist groups, they will trigger the riots, uh, call them racial, use a few bad apple cops as the excuse, all hell will break loose to further destroy confidence. So the next phase, and you can see this being lined up, is the IMF riot, ladies and gentlemen. And you can see they've already primed the detonators with their Black Lives Matter and other operative groups all over the United States, sucking useful idiots in for the next phase. This is an extremely critical time right now. Here's the good news. We know the game plan. And if folks will simply realize that Infowars.com and the brain trust of people we have and researchers we have and analysis we have and focus on history that we have, that if the military and the police and the good people in the government listen to us who are compartmentalized and if the general public will listen to us, this paradigm will fail and will fall. We have the enemy plan. They've done this not in dozens, but hundreds of third world countries, sometimes over and over again in just the last 30 years. They have perfected this takeover plan. For people that aren't researched, this sounds like quantum mechanics or it sounds like equations or something. It's not. It is a shake and bake operation where they know exactly what they're doing with a formula, just like you go to the cupboard and get the pancake mix and you add one egg or two eggs and milk, you stir it up, you put it in the pan, and uh, you get pancakes. I mean, they are following a recipe, they are following a program. As General Benton K. Parton uh, used to say, former head of Air Force Weapons Development, that, that, that the globalists were creating a program to implode the country incrementally, get us dependent on welfare, then have the inner cities riot, and then bring in martial law after that next phase. And they want to steal your pension funds, they want to impoverish you, but they've got to pose like the saviors so they can skim off those and federalize them so they can then transfer the wealth to the offshore banks. Joe Biggs here with Infowars.com. Now, last week, an article came out in the Daily Mail titled Decorated Green Beret is kicked out of U.S. Army Special Forces after shoving Afghan police commander who raped boy who was 12 years old and then beat up his mother when she reported the crime to higher ups. And now you have a decorated soldier who was with the U.S. Army Special Forces for 11 years. He is now being kicked out after he stood up for a young rape victim and his mother who were beaten by this rogue police commander. Now word got out to Sergeant First Class Martland that one of the police commanders that he had trained had sexually assaulted a boy and hit his mother. And he decided to take action. There was a squabble between him and the commander and he shoved this guy to the ground. Now, this Afghan police commander left with only bruises, nothing really serious, and the army saw fit to essentially remove him from his position in Afghanistan, put him at a desk job for a while, and then send him back home, where now they have involuntarily discharged him from the army. Now, there's a lot of people in the operator community, special forces, higher-ups, and politicians who think this is a disgrace and want to hell this Sergeant First Class Martland as a hero, which he should be, because there is a rape culture going on in Afghanistan. I myself have witnessed that type of things uh, when I was deployed in Afghanistan. We used to call it Man Love Thursday, where you would see and hear just some of the most god-awful things that will never leave your mind. Now, you didn't see the actual stuff, but you could see a grown man holding a younger boy's hand, and you know that they weren't father and son, that there was something going on. Now, the Washington Examiner reported on the invading troop struggle with the constant displays of affection towards young boys, as well as glaring evidence of underage homosexual activity. I know Marines and soldiers who have refused to work with Afghan military or police, said one U.S. military official who spoke to the Examiner anonymously. It's not about homosexuality as much as it is about the young boys. Some of them like to show pictures on their cell phone. That should be illegal. Some of the Afghans have their own young boys they use for sexual purpose, and we can't do anything about it. 
Now, the situation is particularly troublesome because the people committing the abuse are the people working with coalition forces. In other words, these are the people the coalition funds. We in the West are working with people who rape children in order to throw out the people who prevented this practice. Now, during the Taliban rule of the region from 1996 until late 2001, under Mullah Omar, Bachabazi was driven from the social norm and outlawed as a transgression against humanity and Allah. A zero-tolerance ban on sodomy and all forms of homosexuality, Bachabazi chief among these, was enforced throughout the region with martial capital and lethal strength. The Taliban's parameters drew from a pre-Islamic Pashtun code as well as a rigid strain of Wahhabi doctrines. This new governance brought with it an emphasis on eliminating immoral vices. Now, any traces of these sexual uh, tendencies or relations between males was met with a swift death sentence. Yet following the overthrow of the Taliban, the practice immediately began again. That leads to the rather sad irony that the very war being fought to liberate Afghans from abuse under the Taliban fueled the abuse of Afghan boys. But like I said, that's something that I've personally seen and been aware of and it's disgusting. And the weird thing is, the problem is, I don't know anything about this Sergeant First Class, uh, Charles Martland whatsoever. He could be a good guy. He could be a bad guy. Maybe he has a series of... Uh, you know, in the past where he snapped or not, or he could be the greatest guy in the world. Really, this man, it, it doesn't matter. I'm sorry that he's being kicked out, but there's a bigger story here than just this operator who is being kicked out for stopping this rape. Now, there's a huge rape culture in Afghanistan. Afghanistan has the most pedophilia per capita in all of Asia. It's out of control. And a lot of this is caused by misinterpretation of the Quran and the way a lot of the Muslims believe that women should be completely clothed. You can only see their eyes. And you'll hear that in a lot of the stories later on where these Afghan soldiers, these men and tribes say, how can I fall in love with a woman if I can't even see her face? I can see all these boys' faces and find out which ones are good looking. And then they turn them into these, uh, what is the term? Bachabazi or yeah Bachabazis and you'll hear the times that I was in Afghanistan you would hear some of the soldiers look at some of our guys and the younger ones who are probably like 18 or 19 with blonde hair they would call them uh, Cheskas which means basically like pretty boy and it's kind of a scary situation when you're in the middle of Afghanistan and there's not that many people around you and you're highly outnumbered by the Afghan population and these guys are looking at you calling you Cheska just know that there was a few of my guys that didn't sleep too good at night knowing that they were uh, being eyeballed but we'll get into that now western forces fighting in southern Afghanistan had a problem too often soldiers on patrol passed on an older man walking hand in hand with a young boy their behavior suggested he was not the boy's father, like I said earlier, in times I've seen. Then British soldiers found that young Afghan men were actually trying to touch and fondle them. Military investigator Anne Maria Cardinale told me that soldiers didn't understand. All of this was disconcerting that the Defense Department hired Cardinale, a social scientist, to examine this mystery. Her report, Pashtun Sexuality, startled not even one Afghan but Western forces were shocked and repulsed. Now, here we are, we're acting like Team America World Police. We're trying to go in and save the day. And yet we know that there's this problem going on and we're not doing anything about it. We're going to kick a hero out, a Green Beret out for trying to stop this pedophilia nature that's happening in Afghanistan. And we're going to let this guy who raped this boy go unpunished. And this is what's been sanctioned by the U.S. State Department. Now, this incident happened with uh, Sergeant Martland back in 2011. Now, guess who was in charge of the State Department in 2011? None other than presidential hopeful Hillary Rodham Clinton. Now, she is the reason that this soldier is essentially being punished. Now we have the documents that the Judicial Watch first reported on back in 2011. But it says here in March of 2014... The U.S. State Department acknowledged the centuries-old practice had become a problem, yet that followed the Obama administration issuing a new army manual telling troops not to judge Afghan social customs, such as the practice of Bacha Bazi. 
And let's go back to the Judicial Watch report of December 11, 2012. New Army Manual orders soldiers not to criticize Taliban. Now, this is a strong indicator that the Obama administration's crusade to appease Islam has gone too far. The draft leaked to the newspaper offers a list of taboo conversation topics that soldiers should avoid, including making derogatory comments about the Taliban, advocating women's rights, any criticism of pedophilia, directing any criticism towards Afghans, mentioning homosexuality and homosexual conduct or anything related to Islam. And on top of that, we're going to go into Afghanistan and we're going to protect opium fields and we're going to allow the opium growth to continue to explode. You have places like Vermont where heroin addiction is out of control and that's all because what we're doing. The government wants you to think that we're going into these wars for good reasons. Everything that we've done in the past has led to drugs. I mean, with Dark Alliance, Gary Webb, Rick Ross. I'm the real Rick Ross. Today, there's a new epidemic, smokable cocaine, otherwise known as crack. I, I will tell you, Director Deutsch, as a former Los Angeles police narcotics detective, that the agency has dealt drugs throughout this country for a long time. The CIA used him as a pawn to sell drugs to help fund the secret war in Nicaragua. These guys coming out and talking about how the CIA is the one that sparked the crack epidemic, that the, the CIA was flying these drugs in. This is something that is going on, and it's a serious matter that needs to be looked at and dealt with. You should not be punished for standing up and doing the right thing. And the fact that our country is going to discharge this soldier, this hero, and turn their back on him when he did the right thing, that shows you what's going on right now. You need to wake up, open your eyes, and see that our country is doing evil, dirty things. It's not all glamour. It's not all glitz. It's not as patriotic as you might make it out to be sometimes. Now, yes, I am a patriot. I'm a former U.S. soldier in the Army, Staff Sergeant Roger. But at the same time, there's a lot of bad stuff going on, and I'm not going to sit back and keep my mouth shut and my eyes closed. I'm going to sit here and talk about it because it's the right thing to do, and we have to bring attention to this. I'm Joe Biggs with Infowars.com. The epidemic of black-on-white cowardly attacks on the elderly and disabled continues. A 76-year-old woman robbed of her purse, then punched and thrown to the ground. Police in Omaha have arrested one of the individuals seen brutally punching a 76-year-old woman in a video that went viral earlier this week. The incident occurred last Sunday morning at St. Cecilia's Cathedral. The elderly lady is seen on a security camera picking up a pamphlet before she is blindsided by two thugs one of whom steals her purse. The other individual then punches the woman full force in the head. She collapses to the ground and subsequently had to be taken to the hospital. Police arrested 22-year-old Wayman Clark, the individual seen throwing the punch in the video. The man who stole the woman's bag remains at large. Court records show that the suspect has a lengthy list of minor arrests. Clark's mother was also arrested for harboring a fugitive. Black on white violent crime captured on videos that go viral now appears to be an almost daily phenomenon. Teenagers attacking random strangers, then running away. It's been reported in cities like Milwaukee, Chicago, St. Louis, and now Lansing. But Weaver says this wasn't the first time he played it. Before he was caught, he and his friends had attacked random people on several occasions. Not many, I say overall, like, like six or seven. I mean, you don't try to rob them or anything. It's just, that's just the game. And have picked up steam since the Black Lives Matter movement came to prominence. A movement that a recent poll shows only 31% of black Americans support. What is knockout? The game knockout is like when people bought it, like they uh, try to see where their hands goes at and whoever comes walking down the block the sun, they just knock them out. You just knock them out, you hit them with a blow, and you take their belongings. Knockout is like when you just punch somebody and they knock, like they go to sleep when you hit them. For years, the press has referred to such incidents with the downplaying title of the knockout game. If white people beat up black people, yeah. it's a horrible racial incident, right? Horrible. And it's been happening in our country for throughout the history of our country. Now, when black people beat up white people and another black guy, it's not a racial attack. 
It is. Violence against anybody because of their race would be, it's totally, it's unacceptable. I don't even see why people think that way anymore. <laughs> Mainstream media provides us with a divisive tone reverberating from the mouths of political leaders struggling to gain a foothold in popular opinion by the age-old technique of divide and conquer, while others assert that they represent a disturbing trend of violent criminals feeling emboldened to attack white people in the belief that it is somehow justified. And in respect for the peaceful protest, I want to say hands up, don't shoot, Black Lives Matter. That's 25-year-old Corey Mosley. You can see walking through the Walmart on Rogers Avenue in Fort Smith carrying an aluminum baseball bat. Then Mosley spots an 18-year-old female alone looking at CDs. You can see what happens next. Just, it's a miracle the young lady, you know, was not very, very seriously hurt. Police say it was a random attack. There's no patterns, there's no prior relationships, there's no prior contacts, which really makes this more disturbing than anything. John Bound for Infowars.com. We had a chance to go to Ferguson, Missouri not that long ago, and we were escorted by some great guys who volunteered their time and their service. We have one of those guys here today, Sam Andrews, who's going to tell us more about the situation in the St. Louis area. And welcome back to the show, Sam. Thank you, Jakari. Nice to be here. Now, you were telling us a little bit earlier that you have some breaking news uh, that's going on in your area. What exactly is going on up there? Well, I just got a phone call that the St. Louis City Police Department, St. Louis Metropolitan PD, arrested two citizens last Wednesday during the violence near Page and Watson. The gentleman's name was David Rolfe and Phil Ellerman. They were arrested by the police because they were spotted traveling on Page with bulletproof vests on in their vehicle. They were pulled over, pulled out of their Impala sedan, and then arrested. Their car was confiscated, their weapons were confiscated, and their ammunition were taken. And then they were charged, I'm hearing, for impersonating police for having bulletproof vests on. Now, I've heard one side of the story. I haven't been able to reach anyone at St. Louis City for comment, but this is extremely troubling. Yes, because we've seen, uh, of course, we know it wasn't that long ago you and your great crew escorted myself and Joe Biggs around the city of St. Louis, or excuse me, of Ferguson, Missouri, and you had firearms, you had bulletproof vests, which anybody could buy at any place. Myself and Joe Biggs just went to the gun show the other day and where you can buy bulletproof vests as well as firearms. So it's not impersonating an officer to have those things. Both of those things are completely legal and lawful. Well, what was more troubling than that was their statements that the police had questioned them over 12 times each after separating them, accusing them of being an oath keeper. You are an oath keeper. You, you're former military. You're an oath keeper. They kept demanding that they admit that they were oath keepers when, in fact, they were just driving to their father's home to check on their father's house and make sure it wasn't burnt down in the rioting. Right. So... What you're saying here is a very troubling uh, precedent to set that just men driving in their own personal vehicle, one, can be stopped, pulled over, two, you know, being charged for impersonating officers because of the paraphernalia that they had on them, and then three, that being charged that they're oath keepers as if that was some type of crime to begin with. Well, what's even more troubling is, A, these men are not oath keepers. B, they've never been oath keepers. One of them had never even joined the military but yet the police would not accept their answer that they were not Oath Keepers. And they kept pushing and pushing and pushing them. And what's really troubling is we now have a pattern with the St. Louis County Police Chief telling Oath Keepers they can't open carry and St. Louis City policemen now accosting people, accusing them of being Oath Keepers, arresting them, and now they've confiscated this man's car and they can hold his car and his guns for up to a year. It's completely ridiculous, because I know you were there when we had a chance to speak to Chief Bel Belmar, and I know you were very upset by some of the things that he said. Can you tell uh, our viewers what he said to you that day, Sam? Well, what's really troubling is Belmar, in our discussion face-to-face, -face, claimed on video that there was no state of emergency declared in Ferguson, and that 44.101 didn't matter. And then he claimed later on that he didn't know what that law meant. He had lawyers and he would deal with that later. And then he unlawfully told us 
that we were not allowed to open carry our rifles in an open carry state where the law 21.750.1 section 2 says very clearly that we are allowed to open carry our rifles and no county may adopt an ordinance interfering with that in any way. Yes, that's right, because I had a chance to speak to some of the officers earlier that same day, and I asked them, what law are these guys violating when they carry their firearms? They said they're not violating a law by carrying the firearms. I said, what's the problem? Well, we're looking into that. They're digging through the law books, trying to find something to charge you guys with. So, Sam, with the few seconds we have left, give people your final thoughts and, you know, what they can expect from you in the near future. Well, how horrible that police officers all around St. Louis County and St. Louis City are carrying guns and they have absolutely no idea what our gun laws are. How terrible is that? We as Missouri citizens expect every citizen, including the police, if you're going to carry a gun, you must be responsible and learn the laws that pertain to the carrying of that weapon. The other thing that bothers me more than anything is that our police chief is lying to our face in one video, he says there's no state of emergency and we can't carry. And then a few nights later on the Almond report, the chief of police claims that there was a state of emergency, that the Oath Keepers used it to advance their platform, and that he's pro-Second Amendment and absolutely for gun rights. This man's lying. He's talking out of both sides of his mouth. These people don't follow our laws and nothing's being done about it. And more to that, Sam, I'll speak to the situation last year when myself, Joe Biggs, and Josh Owens were out there in August. They said that your actions were inflammatory and unnecessary, something to that effect. But back in August, they were aiming guns at people in the crowd, shooting tear gas at the people in the crowd, shooting rubber bullets indiscriminately into the cloud of tear gas. I told that to Belmar himself. He said, well, we're looking into it and we'll try to do better next time. Sam Andrews, I definitely thank you for your reporting and also watching our backs while we were out there. And we look forward to hearing more from you in the near future. Thank you, Jakari. Be safe. Thank you.